Hey guys, my name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor here at New Life Church, and I want to welcome you to our online teachings. One of our core convictions as a church is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. Now, I know that for some of us, coming into a church building might be intimidating, it might be scary, and I get that. But I want you to know that there is always a place for you here at New Life and that you were made for real in-person community. We meet on Sundays in downtown Wayland. You can check out our website for more information on service times. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through his word. Love you guys. Well, good morning, New Life Church. How you guys doing this morning? You guys doing well? Everybody have a good weekend? Yeah? I, uh, we're just going to get the awkwardness out of the way. Yes, I had a run-in with a wood splitter yesterday. And I am just fine, uh, but I don't want to distract you with wondering what happened to Brad's thumb. So that's what's going on with me today. Uh, let's go ahead and pray together, and then we're going to dive into the Word. Jesus, as we just sang, your name is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's powerful. And Jesus, this morning we gather for no other reason than to lift that name up high together as one body, one community. God, I pray for uh, those that are here. I pray for those that are watching online. God, may you speak to our church today. As we enter into a fall that feels in some ways unknown, in some ways tumultuous, God, um, I just pray that you will continue to move in us, that you will lead us, that you will guide us. Um, and that your presence will be felt among every single person here this morning. And so we pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So we are in the second week of a series called Fight My Battles. And so we are talking through some of the best war stories uh, in the Old Testament. And today is one of my absolute, absolute favorites. So I want to begin by telling you a little bit about uh, one of my favorite historical characters. Anybody know who this is? Winston Churchill. Man, this guy was a genius of a leader. He came into the British prime ministership. I don't know if that's how you say it. He became prime minister of Great Britain in 1941, I believe it was, right? As the, um, he came in as kind of a, a wartime leader and uh, within weeks of him coming to power, he, won, he led through the Dunkirk evacuation where thousands of British troops were evacuated from the shore of Dunkirk um, as Nazi forces were beginning to, to kind of uh, in, invade them and, and pursue them. He also is credited with leading Great Britain through this unshakable like, resolve to resist Nazism. Right? And so there was a lot of pressure on him in leadership to strike like peace treaties and kind of compromise with the Nazis. And he's really credited for leading kind of this, this, this fight in Great Britain against the Nazis. He's also credited with being kind of the brains behind the operation of the Allied forces. So the forces fighting Nazi Germany. I mean, this man was a powerhouse of a leader. But at the same time, he was kind of a strange dude in some ways. He had a very specific routine that he walked through every single day when he was working from home. Every day, his days looked identical to each other. He would wake up and stay in bed till about 11 a.m. All the high school students in the room are like nudging their parents right now. See, he can do it. What you don't know is he woke up at 7 a.m. and worked for four hours in his bed um, on just the different stuff that he was doing. And then he would wake up, and he would wear pretty much the same type of outfit every single day, which you see pictured here. These are children's rompers that his wife made for him, which if you can see the picture, like, looks almost as ridiculous as it sounds. He wore the same outfit, these children's rompers. And then he would eat a three-course lunch every single day with his family, followed by a scotch and soda and a nap time every single day. This man took an hour and a half nap every day. His routine was absolutely rigid. Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter what Winston Churchill's daily routine was? Because a lot of people and a lot of leaders and a lot of historians credit his daily routine with his success. See, every single day for Winston Churchill, he sought to reduce the amount of decisions he had to make. 
He sought to reduce the amount of variance, the amount of deviance in his day. He wanted his days as consistent and straightforward as possible so that he could lead Britain through a tumultuous, unknown time as effectively as he possibly could. See, Winston Churchill, he built his legacy by reducing the other things in his life so that he could be the best leader possible in a time when Great Britain really, really needed him. Now, we're conditioned in our culture today to believe that more is better, right? Like, more choices is better. Bigger, louder is better. Like, like the more that we can accumulate and the more that we can build up, we're not taught to reduce, we're taught to increase in our culture. Bigger, louder, more, more choices, bigger houses, louder arguments, bigger bank accounts. That's what we value in our culture today in so many ways. Like when was the last time you looked at your bank account and thought, hmm, I make too much money. I, I've never done that. When was the last time you, you like posted something on social media on Facebook and was like, ooh, that's just getting way too many likes. I, like, I, I need less likes on that photo. When was the last time your team scored too many points? You're like, we're Lions fans. We don't have that problem. <laughs> and yet... Guys, for so many of us, 2020 has not been a year of more, has it? It's been a year of less. For a lot of us, it's been a year of less people. Anybody remember that like three month quarantine we did where we saw nobody? It's been a, no, <laughs> like we didn't do it. That's why we're still in this, because people like you, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's been a year for, for a lot of us of, of less money, right? Like some of us have, have lost jobs. You know, I think it's easy for like a church to look at a pastor and assume we're untouched by this. But like my wife's lost a lot of income. We're, we're in the same boat. You guys are, I don't show that out of sympathy or, or pity. I show that just to say we're like, we're, we're right alongside you in, in the struggle here. It's been a year of less. It's been a year of less options, less plans. All around, it's been a year of less. And I wonder if many of us have stopped, if we've paused long enough to ask ourselves the question, does God build things the same way we do? Does God use more, bigger, better, more options, more stuff, more money, more people? Does he build things the same way that I do in this life? Or does God build a different way? Does God build by reducing? Does God build by increasing or does God build by reducing? I would argue that God builds differently, that he actually builds things by reducing, by decreasing. Let me show you what I mean. We're going to be in Judges chapter 6 today. Judges 6, one of my favorite battle stories in the Old Testament. And uh, I'm going to set up the, the context before we dive into the text really quick here. Uh, but basically, Israel has been on this conquest of this promised land that God had promised to give them. And they find themselves in this situation in the book of Judges where they are actually being attacked repeatedly by this army of Midianites. For seven years, it says this, the Israelites are being attacked by Midianites. And so as you can imagine, the Israelites are getting a little bit tired of this. And so they cry out to God. And this is God's response to this perpetual attack on his people. In chapter 6, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite. Now, real quick here. Any times you see in the Old Testament, and it says this multiple different times, the angel of the Lord, we actually believe that this is pre-incarnate Jesus coming and having this conversation. And so Jesus, in other words, came and sat down on the oak tree, where, uh, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord, or Jesus, appeared to Gideon, he said to him, the Lord is with you, what? Mighty, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. 
Pardon me, <laughs> my Lord, Gideon replied. Excuse me? But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? In other words, why are the Midianites attacking us for so many years in a row? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. So let me paint this picture for you for a minute here. You have essentially two kind of forces in this story. You have the enemy forces, the Midianites, and then you have the Israelite forces that God is calling Gideon to lead to defeat this enemy, the Midianites. Now let me tell you a little bit about the Midianites here. The Midianites had an army strong of about 135,000 men. In fact, Scripture describes them as like swarms of locusts. This is how many men the Midianite army had. The Midianites invented, this is just amazing and hilarious, uh, the, the Midianites invented camel warfare, which is as ridiculous as it sounds, where they would attack people on their camels. It was a total spit show around there. 135,000 men attacking these Israelites, and the way that they did it is they would come when the Israelite people were getting ready to harvest their crops, and they would steal all of the food, all of the grain from them, leaving Israel in a perpetual state of dependence, hunger, and fear. Year after year of essentially forced famine by this oppressive army, stealing the crops, stealing the livelihood, stealing the ability to eat and produce every single year. And then we meet our hero, Gideon. And uh, Gideon, when we're introduced to him, is threshing wheat in a wine press, which we read that in 2020 and maybe shrug our shoulders or don't really like think about it that much. But this is a really important kind of thing that the author of Judges is telling us here. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. So has anybody ever threshed wheat in general here? Anybody? I'm surprised in a group of farmers nobody's done that. So here's the process. I don't know how we do it today, but here's what they did back uh, in the Israelite time for threshing wheat. So what they would do is they would find this area of a field that had a really good kind of wind flow through it. And so what you'd do is you'd take up a pitchfork and you'd kind of lift up the wheat and you'd throw it into the air. Probably shouldn't do it with a thumb like this. But you throw it up into the air and what happens is the wind would catch the wheat and it would blow the chaff away, which was light and kind of airy, and then the grain would fall to the ground and they would be able to collect the grain and do whatever they needed to do with it. Well, when Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press, he's essentially in an indoor kind of underground area where there would be no what? Air. No wind or air blowing, no air flow. So imagine it's like he's doing this, throwing it up and like, <laughs> like trying to get it separated, right? So he's, he's in this place where it makes no sense to be threshing wheat. And that's exactly where God meets him. See, Gideon, the text is telling us, man, he's in survival mode. And it's easy for us to look at someone like Gideon and assume that he's just this man that's full of fear, full of anxiety, hiding out from the Midianites, just this wimpy little guy. But how many of us have found ourselves in survival mode this past year? I think for me, like, survival mode is a term I've used all the time. Like, things just feel so fragile. Gideon's just trying to protect his family. He's just trying to get by. He's just trying to provide food in a world where food is stolen from his people. I don't know about you, but I can't blame the guy because it's felt like a lot like what 2020 has felt like for so many of us, that we're just trying to get by, that we're just trying to survive, that, that it's not a year of abundance. It's actually a year of decrease. 
And here's the principle that I want you to take away from who God calls in the first place. God builds by reducing. He invites the most unlikely people to agree with God about who they already are. I'm going to read that again because I think some of us need to hear that this morning. God invites the most unlikely people to agree with him about who they are. See, when Jesus meets Gideon in this text, he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. It's the Hebrew word chayel. I love Hebrew because you can do like the <laughs> noises. Chayel. Say that out loud. Chayel. Coronavirus just got spread everywhere. But <laughs> Chayel. It's this word mighty warrior. And guess what? It's not just used to describe men in the Bible. Ro- Ruth is described as Chayel, a mighty warrior. Proverbs 31, this picture of the ideal woman, the word Chayel is used. It is this word of steadfastness, rootedness, unmovable, unshakableness. And this is the identity that the angel of the Lord speaks to Gideon. The Lord is with you, Chayel, mighty warrior. And Gideon's response is, what? Me? See, Gideon's in this place where he's stuck in insecurity. He essentially says, you've got the wrong guy. You've got the wrong people. Look around me. I've lost so much in this season. Can't you see how big the Midianite army is? God, where have you been? Can't you see how unending this pandemic seems to be? Where have you been? Can't you see that I've lost my job? I've lost relationships. I've lost plans. God, where have you been? God, the world feels like it's going to hell in a handbasket. God, where have you been in the midst of all of that? And it's in Gideon's weakness. It's in his moments of greatest insecurity where God meets him and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And I love what God does when Gideon says, look at me. I'm the weakest of the weak of the weak. God says, you're right, I didn't notice that. No, what does he say? He says, go in the strength that you are going to have when this pandemic is over. Go in the strength that you are going to have when your army has defeated Midian. Go in the strength that you're going to have when your financial situation works itself out or your job work. No, he doesn't say any of that to Gideon. What does he say? He says, go in the strength that you already have before the battle is won, before the situation is resolved. Go in the strength you already have because God is already with you. He hasn't left you behind. In seasons of greatest hopelessness, in seasons of that feel just like I'm trying to survive, God is with you. And he is calling the people who are in survival mode, the people who feel like they are the weakest of the weak, the people who feel like they are the lowest of the low, because God doesn't build things the way we do. He builds his armies He builds his forces by inviting the most unlikely, unqualified, unappealing people into his story. And it's a beautiful thing about who God is. He builds by reducing, by inviting unlikely people to agree with him about who they already are in him. That's a gospel truth that some of us need to hear this morning. That before you have done anything, when you are in a position where you feel like you are maybe the weakest of the weak, that you are just trying to survive, and for God to call you into a new purpose, into a new calling in your life, feels almost, I don't know, it almost feels like, God, do you see what I'm going through? Like, God, do you know what I've walked through of this last season? And what God says to him and to us is God is already with you. I don't know about you, but mighty warrior is not a term I would use to describe myself, and it certainly was not a term Gideon would have used to describe himself, and yet God still speaks this identity over him because he invites the most unlikely people to agree with him about who they already are. God doesn't build things the way that we do. And so what happens next is Gideon kind of puts God through a series of tests, and we're not going to get into that today, but God essentially obviously proves himself to Gideon. And so Gideon begins assembling this army to go and defeat Midian. And so he's assembling this army, and he manages to get 32,000 troops 
together to go fight this army, which is not a bad number. I mean, I don't know that I could, like, rally 32,000 people to go fight an army, but he does this. He rallies these people together to go fight this army, this little weak guy, but he notices there's a problem because Israel has 32,000. How many does Midian have? What did we say earlier? 135,000. There is a problem with the numbers here. And what God does is he goes again to Gideon. He says, Gideon, little G, I see a problem with your numbers. And Gideon's like, God, I was just going to say that. You're right. There is a problem with my numbers. I have 32,000. They have 135,000. There's not nearly enough troops to defeat them. And before Gideon can finish, God's like, you have way too many men. And Gideon's like, excuse me, Big G? Like, really? God's like, yeah. Like, if you take these 32,000 and go win against 135,000, you're going to think it was you that did it all. Your people are going to think it was them that did it all. I want to beat them. The people that are oppressing you and stealing things from you, I want to beat them in a way that says it's only God. And so Gideon goes to his men, his 32,000 men, and he goes, if you're scared... If you're fearful, and I imagine they probably just like scram before he can even finish his statement, but he says, if you're fearful, go home. And immediately, 22,000 of them leave. (laughs) Gideon's like, sweet. We're really going to lose now. So 10,000 versus 135,000. God does not build the same way we do. He actually builds by reducing But that even wasn't enough for God. So join me again in Judges chapter 7, verse 4 through 8. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I I will thin them out for you. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. Going to the next slide there, Clay. might have to open the paper Bible here. Uh, we might be frozen up there. That can happen. Oh, there we go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. Can you feel the tension in this moment? So God reduces this army from 32,000 men down to 300 men. If you're good with math, you know that this is a 450 to 1 ratio. One farmer, essentially, for every 450 men riding camels (laughs) stealing food. This is odds that are stacked against Israel's favor in every possible way. 451. That's like saying Wayland is going to go beat ISIS. Like, it's not really going to happen, right? And, and it's easy to kind of think through this idea of 300 men and have this picture in your mind, like Gerard Butler's 300, like, this is Sparta, like, yeah. But it actually is probably more like DeAndre Swift's Lions last <laughs> week. <laughs> too soon? Was that too soon? No, this is a group of 300 farmers going to take on this well-trained, well-armed militia of 135,000 people. I want to pause for a second here and just ask you, what was Gideon's real battle? Was it a battle around him or was it a battle within him? Was his enemy Midian? Or was his true enemy a fear of man? Was his enemy flesh and blood, or was his, own, his enemy his own inadequacy, his own doubts about who God is and what he can do? Was his problem too small of an army, or was it too small of a view of who God is? What is your battle that you're in right now? Is it a job loss? Is it relational loss, health issues, security over the future? 
Is it a loss of routine? What is, what is the battle that you are in right now that feels so in, insurmountable? Is that a battle around you or is that a battle within you? Sometimes I think it's easy for us to think it's a battle around us, but the battles that God fights, the battles that God wins and lo- wins by reducing, they're more often battles within us, not just battles around us. Because God doesn't build the same way we do. God builds by reducing, and he invites us to agree with him about who he is. So he doesn't just invite us to agree with him about who we are. He also invites us to agree with him about who he is. That for Gideon, he calls the weakest of the weak, and he says, I am with you. He builds by reducing. He has Gideon go and destroy his family altars right afterwards to reduce and decrease and get rid of everything that distracts him and says, I am with you. God builds by reducing. He recruits a ragtag army of 32,000 people and 31,700 of them leave because God builds by reducing. God builds by reducing. And uh, so what ends up happening in the story is Gideon takes this army. He takes this army after receiving a vision from God. He assembles his men and DeAndre Swift. (laughs) They surround the Midianite camp with trumpets and with lanterns. They blew the trumpets, smashed the lanterns, and the Midianites ultimately turn on each other and many from the Midianite army fled. And here's what I don't want you to miss. So, so the Midianite army, they turn on each other, but those that fled, Gideon and his men chase after them. And this is what it says about their running after them. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and passed it and crossed it. What does that middle line say? Let's read that out loud together exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit. I see myself in Gideon's story. And I imagine you probably see yourself in Gideon's story as well. This has been a season of exhaustion. This has been a season of inc- or decrease, of reducing. And yet Gideon is this incredible picture of faith because it's in the midst of his doubts, in the midst of his own inadequacies, in his maintenance mode, in his fear mode, in his exhausted mode, that he keeps up the pursuit of what God has for him, even when it's hard. If that's where you are today, if this year has been a year of exhaustion and decrease and reducing and trains driving by. (laughs) I want you to hear this. God doesn't build the same way you do. He builds by reducing. And if we know that God has been in a, a mode of reducing in our lives this year, then it begs the question, the question remains, then what does God want to build? What does God want to build in me in this season? What does God want to build in you in this season? What does God want to build in our families, in our church? What does God want to build if he builds by reducing? We have this this vision on the wall over here. These five zeros that our mission as a church is not done until zero people in our community, in our world, remain unchanged by Jesus. That our vision as a church, it's not done. Our work, our mission, it's not done until zero people remain unchanged by Jesus. That's a vision of building by reducing. And I've wrestled with this summer a lot over what vision do we call our church to collectively this fall? I have found myself in Gideon's wine press more times than I want to say where I'm just trying to get by, just trying to survive, just trying to hold on. And I imagine you've been in that place over the season two where you are in Gideon's wine press, where you are in survival mode, maintenance mode, and you're just trying to survive. 
people in our leadership at New Life over and over again have challenged me this summer. Like, call, we need to call people to a vision going into this fall. What is the vision? And my response has been a wine press response every single time. I don't know because I don't know where the world is headed. I don't know where the economy is headed. I don't know where things are headed. It has been my response every single time. And this story speaks so powerfully to me, not just as a pastor, but as a husband, as a dad, as a, as a son. God builds by reducing. He doesn't build his church the same way I would choose to build his church. He doesn't build my life the same way that I would choose to build my life. He doesn't build you and your family the same way that you would choose to build you and your family and your security. He doesn't build the same way we do. And many times he builds by reducing. And we see this in the person of Jesus. Philippians 2 is this beautiful picture of Jesus who, being in very nature with God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. He reduced himself. He emptied himself out on our behalf. God builds by reducing, and he invites each and every one of us to take small steps to join him in his story and allow him to do the miraculous through us. When I look at the stories of our church over this last season, I don't think it's the big stuff that needs to be celebrated. You know, we were in a, a point where we were moving to two services because we packed this building so full back in March. And in the church world, like, it's been so common, not just here but everywhere, to celebrate the bigger and the better and the more and the increase. But what God has spoken to me so clearly over the season is that I believe that he wants to build something beautiful in our community, but it does not look the way I thought it was going to look in any way. That when I look at the stories of our church over the last season, it's not the big things that are the coolest things. It's not the big things that are the most evident of God's working. It's the small things. It's the discipleship group, a group of five or six men and women that are meeting here faithfully every single Tuesday night. And their one mission is not to grow bigger, it's to multiply themselves and go be an influence in their world for Jesus. It's to go disciple other people. And life change is happening here in that group of five or six people on Tuesday nights. God builds by reducing. He does it in the small things. I think of NTS camp, four middle school boys coming up to their leader and saying, we want more accountability to be in the word of God. Middle school boys. God builds by reducing. He does it in the small things, not the big things. This is the, the wheelchair ramp that gets built for a neighbor in Otsego who is so resistant to the idea of faith and God, and yet this wheelchair ramp became a bridge for a family in our church to begin having conversations about Jesus. And that family has led a home group this whole summer where they blast our church services in their garage, and guess who is hearing, but more importantly, listening outside the garage to those church services? This neighbor who the ramp was built for. God builds by reducing. Amen. And I imagine that if every single one of us in this church were willing to take a small step of faith going into the fall, that God would have a huge impact in our community and in our own lives. And so that's where I want to end today. I want to end with this idea of what does it mean for you to think small this fall? For you to take a small step of faith and watch God do big things through it. So I want to just give you some examples. There's a card near your, your seat here, and I want you to just grab that. And I want to just give you a, a couple different ideas, a couple different thoughts of what this could mean for you. And ultimately what you write, I, I really want you to spend some time over the next couple minutes and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. This card on the top line says, My Think Small Next Step Is... And how will I make this happen? Maybe for you, your next step is to get baptized. I think of even how baptisms, earlier this year, they were this giant celebration where like 16 people or 12 people would get baptized in one, you know, one Sunday morning. But what if God actually wants us to think smaller? What if he wants us to go to each other's homes and baptize there with a little cell phone recording and show it on Sundays and celebrate it that way? 
What if God wants us to, sell up, to set up the baptismal for one single person to get baptized on a Sunday just because they feel like that's what their next step is? God builds by reducing. So if your next step is baptism, we don't have a date on the calendar, but your next step on the top line, you would write baptism. And on the bottom line, how I will make this happen is I will email Brad today, brad at newlifewayland.org, and say, I want to get baptized, and I will personally set up that horse shop just to baptize you. Because God builds by reducing, and we will make it happen. If you're watching online and you're not comfortable coming into the space on a Sunday morning, we'll do it on a Tuesday. I don't care when we'll do it, but we will make it happen because God builds by reducing. Maybe you're a, a man in here, and uh, for this last season, you've been in maintenance mode with your family's faith. And God is calling you to man up and to step up for maybe the first time in your family's history. To be the one that says, you know what, faith is going to be an important part of our family. Maybe it's signing up for a men's small group that we're offering. Maybe it's committing to a faith routine like church attendance or getting your kids to youth group or whatever that might be. Maybe it's just modeling better faith in your home for your kids. These rhythms of talking to God, of asking your kids how they saw God at work today. If you're a woman in this, in this uh, room today or, or watching online, Maybe, maybe you're the one that controls your budgeting and your financing, and your family has never taken the opportunity to tithe regularly. You know, it's easy for us to, to look at a space next door and say, we really want to transform that into a youth center. But you know what I'm looking at right now? I'm looking at the fact that I think we need more people to think small and to begin consistently giving of themselves financially to make that a sustainable option for us in the future. It's not the big things, it's the small things that God desires to work through in us. Maybe for you, you're a student here, and you're kind of getting used to this rhythm of, of kind of a new school routine, and it feels unknown, and it feels unfamiliar to you. And what God is calling you to do is to identify the other students around you that easily fall through the cracks, that other people don't want to associate with, that are cyberbullied, that are beat up, like, electronically or physically and to see those students and to move towards them. And so what you would write on here is my think small next step is, and then maybe it's a name for you, and you just write down a name. How I will make this happen, I will send them an encouraging DM this afternoon or whatever it takes. Maybe for you, you're here, and, and you just feel isolated, and you feel alone, and your next step is to sign up for community, to sign up for a small group, to get around other people that are going to push you consistently and regularly towards Jesus, even when it's hard. Guys, I don't know what the world is going to look like, but I believe God is calling us to think small, to build by reducing, to take these outrageously small face steps that he's going to move bigly in, which is not even a word, but I like it. Uh, so with that being said, allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to you. This year could really change us if we let God do the work in us. Maybe you need some time, but I want each and every person to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to write down what your next step is, and these cards are yours to keep. This is your own accountability. Maybe you share it with somebody. Maybe you take your next step this afternoon. But what is it for you? How does God want to build by reducing in your life? Let's pray together, and the band is going to make their way back up. God, you are still working. God, you are at work building something beautiful in our midst. And God, as we as a church, whether watching online or here in the building, we want to be surrendered like Gideon was to how you want to build and what you want to build. And God, it may be uncomfortable for us. It may stretch us. But God, I think of your words to Gideon. Go in the strength you already have. Go in the strength you have because you are with us. And so God, may we agree with you about who we are and who you are. And God, I just pray that through the small steps that are taken today, the small steps that are taken this week of faith, the commitments to, to doing something better, to allowing something bigger to happen in us and through us, God, that you may transform lives this coming fall. 
not because of anything we've done, not because of anything we've built, but because you are the one who is still at work even when we cannot see it. So God, we love you and we trust you, and it's in your name that we pray. And everyone said, amen.